very much for having. Sorry, thank you very much for having me. Um, I am Janelle Fox. I'm a pediatric urologist at the Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters, which is affiliated with Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, we have a urology residency. We don't have a fellowship, so our residents work doubly hard for pediatrics. They get some very good cases. Um, we have a surprising amount of pediatric stone disease in our area. Um, we are part of the stone belt still in the southern states of the US and that's probably why. So I'd like to present this talk about a, a general overview for pediatric urolithiasis and then a series of four difficult cases and how they were managed. Um, so my disclosures, some of the content is from the AUA core curriculum for reference, video footage from um, my prior position at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, so they were all videos I took, and then the CHP stone pathway, which is a stone pathway I created for our ER, but I have no financial disclosures. The objectives today, we're going to review the increasing prevalence of pediatric urolithiasis, at least in, in the US. So it is becoming an economic problem as well as a increasing disease problem here in the US. And they haven't really pinpointed a direct reason, but there are several metabolic syndromes and risk factors that increase a child's risk for urolithiasis that are probably contributing. Um, I would like to review the roles of ESWL, so extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, ureteroscopy, and percutaneous nephrolithotomy as the mainstay treatments for stone disease. And then we'll talk about the old argument of fragmenting versus dusting stones when you do laser lithotripsy. We'll discuss um, the most recent laser types that are used for stone clearance, and we'll present some difficult cases. So epidemiology wise in the US, um, the incidence of stones about 10 years ago was about 60 per 100,000 people. Um, that is increasing over time. So each decade we're seeing a rise. Um, the biggest rise has been in adolescent or teenage females. Um, it was noted over the last 20 to 30 years that women in general were having increasing rates of stones compared with in the past when we usually used to think used to think of this as a man's disease. Um, there's about a 50% recurrence for stones at three years after the initial stone incident in children. So we're a bit more aggressive about working up why kids form stones and not just attributing it to bad diet dehydration. Um, there's been a 72% increased risk in our healthcare costs for the treatment of stones just over a five year period largely reflective of the increasing stone burden. Um, but some of the main risk factors are genetics. So we know that stone disease can come in either monogenic or polygenic stone types. Polygenic is the most common, and that's basically when your mom or your dad or your grandma had stones, usually calcium-based stones, but they never really pinpointed why. There wasn't one gene that we could say was the cause. Um, then there's the monogenic stone disease, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, there are co comorbid conditions, so immobility, um, G-tube feeds, a ketogenic diet in our children with seizure disorders. So classically, these are our immobile patients or patients with severe seizures. Um, anatomy, such as bladder augmentation, uh, bladder neck ligation, congenital UPJ obstruction, even high-grade kidney reflux can all contribute to the increased risk of stones. And as mentioned, um, teen females are at the highest risk, especially Caucasian girls. They're about five times more likely than anyone else to form a stone. Um, in terms of diet and obesity, we kind of initially thought that, hey, Americans are just getting overweight and they have a terrible diet and everything's in a box that they eat. But when you look at the actual obesity data, there is not a direct correlation of the increased risk of stone with BMI, even when looking at Z-scores. If you break 
down stone disease into tertiles. So your underweight, your normal weight, and your overweight slash obese group, we do know that overweight and obese are at increased risk, but that may actually be a confounder or surrogate for some other risk factor. Um, the ketogenic diet, so ketogenic diet is a known risk factor, and the ketogenic diet is becoming increasingly popular even amongst people who aren't on a seizure diet. So for the seizure diet, um, they have very minimal sugar, very high protein intake, and it's basically increasing your amino acid load and the acidity of your urine. Um, the problem is that a lot of Americans will also do that kind of diet for weight loss. Oops, sorry. It does reduce potassium citrate, or sorry, it reduces the citrate uh, load in your urine. And so the risk for stones can be reduced by the addition of potassium citrate. Um, again, as mentioned, obesity is a bit of a mixed bag. Medication wise, we know Topamax causes hypercalciuria and hypocipaturia. Uh, we know Lasix will increase calcium secretion at the level of the tubules. Um, but the data on Lasix is a little less convincing these days. And some of these stones are transient in our NICU babies and our infants. They can be watched and sometimes do go away on their own. Um, corticosteroids mess with calcium hemostasis and bone breakdown, which is how they can contribute to stone disease. And some of our kids who are on chronic steroids over time and have um, bone thinning will be at increased risk. Um, so in children, they present a bit differently. Many of our kids present incidentally, so they're being worked up for something else. They have a Dietl's crisis from their underlying UPJ obstruction, and we happen to find a stone. Um, the stereotypical presentation kids, if they are symptomatic, is that teen girls are generally going to present with renal colic, like your adult patients. Um, but the younger children, they often don't present with that classic nausea, vomiting, flank pain history. It may be an incidental finding on other imaging. They may have gross hematuria. They may have a urinary tract infection or febrile UTI. They may just have generalized belly pain. So risk factors for a stone at presentation, lateralizing flank pain is always nice when you have it. Again, it's not um, a rule in kids. If they've had a history of nephrolithiasis, that dramatically increases their risk. Nausea vomiting can be a symptom, but it's not very specific. Um, and then gross or microhematuria. Metabolic syndromes that are associated with stone disease. So when we look at our monogenic stone disease, um, we would consider doing a genetic workup if there's a known history of consanguinity in the family. Um, or if there's a family history of nephrocalcinosis, plus we see that the child has nephrocalcinosis, um, the conditions we're more likely to find are primary hyperoxaluria, cystinuria, or DHA stones, or if they fail to respond to the conventional treatments. So you've got a kid that had a ureteral stone, and now they've got a renal stone, and next year they have another stone. So if they're really kind of defying the normal presentation of stones in kids multiply recurrent. So let's go over cystinuria. This is one of the hardest and most frustrating conditions for a family and a urologist. <laughs> it's an autosomal recessive condition. Um, it increases the cysteine burden in the urine by twofold and the cysteine forms into a dimer, which is no longer soluble. Um, it precipitates out typically at um, more acidic values, so you can alkalinize the urine to help. Uh, however, that's not enough. They have to be on cysteine binders. So typically thiola or tiopronin is the best tolerated one in children. It can be really pretty hard to get. Um, pharmacies here, they don't fill it. It has to be ordered through the company. So then it's very hard to tell if you're kiddo or your family is actually purchasing it and giving it to their, their kid. Um, low protein diet does help. So we don't want people on very high or ketotic diets. And they have to drink at least three liters per day 
many times cystinurics are presenting when they're four, five, six years old. So getting a kiddo to drink that much is very, very challenging. We basically have to set a new normal for their parents in terms of how much they should be drinking. Um, in terms of pri primary hyperoxaluria, this is probably one of the other more common conditions that we're gonna see. These kids can be as young as infants presenting with multiple um, kidney or even ureteral stones. Um, type one is probably the more common one. Primary hyperoxaluria used to cause liver disease and liver failure. Um, it historically really only had pyridoxine as treatment options, but now we have other options like lunazarin, which is, um, I believe it's a micro RNA um, that inhibits um, the conversion to glycoxylate and buildup of oxalate in the urine. So this has been a game changer for our primary hyperoxaluric patients um, where we actually see their nephrocalcinosis reverse and their liver disease halt. Um, it often led to kidney transplant and liver transplant in many of our children. Now we're hoping it doesn't. Um, other stone types would be DHA stones. I will be honest, I've never seen one of these in particular. This is more of an academic um, stone, but they can happen. The treatment is allopurinol and then um, urine dips to look at DHA crystals in the urine. This can lead to renal failure and it's often very delayed in diagnosis because you're just not looking for it. Um, stone types that cause nephrocalcinosis. So nephrocalcinosis obviously is that diffuse calcification of your medullary pyramids with multiple calicial tip stones. You do your ureteroscopy, you've got Randall's plaques everywhere. So um, these kiddos often uh, were preterm. They were often in the NICU. They often got steroids, Lasix. They had many risk factors. Uh, for poor calcium metabolism. Um, many have bronchopulmonary dysplasia and that's the reason they were getting steroids because of their early lungs. Um, and about 15% will require surgical intervention. So again, if it's just calcification within the parenchyma and the calicial tip stones, we can watch them over time. Many times if this is a NICU baby with nephrocalcinosis, the process reverses. If this is an older patient with nephrocalcinosis, we're going to want to do a workup with 24-hour um, urines. And if we see that there's a strong family history, we may do RTA testing. Um, we may do um, testing for primary hyperoxaluria if they have increased oxalate in their urine. Um, in terms of idiopathic stones, these are our polygenic stones, so we don't have a clear-cut gene. Um, there can be an up to 56% risk of passing on risk factors for stones when we look at twin studies. So oftentimes you will get a family history when a kid has a stone. Now what are the conservative things we can do for stone prevention? So I like this slide because it's age appropriate fluid intake for stone formers. And when I look at that, I'm thinking, man, I have a 16 year old daughter. There is no way she's drinking 2.3 liters of fluid per day. And even if she had a stone, I'd be hard pressed to get her to drink that. So this can be pretty challenging to do. It's actually easier to get your infants and your toddlers to drink more because they're always running around with the sippy cup, drinking their water and their juice. But the teens, they're tough to really um, affect any kind of dietary and behavioral change. The other thing that's hard, at least in the States, is the sodium intake. And that's because um, fast food, box dinners, anything processed that sits on your shelf or in your freezer, has really quite a lot of sodium in it. But for adults, we wanna cap that sodium intake at 2,500 milligrams per day. For children, even less. And at least in my household, my kids are the ones that love the salty foods more than I do. 
Calcium um, is a little bit of a, a conundrum. Most families think that they shouldn't be taking it when their kid has a calcium-based stone, but it's actually quite the opposite. It's pretty rare that kids have absorptive hypercalciuria. More commonly, their bones are breaking it down in order to get it. Um, so they need to be taking 2,500 milligrams per day once they hit those pubertal years. Um, other stone prevention meds that we use. So say you have a kiddo diagnosed with a ureteral stone. We have done studies on alpha blockers in children, just as we have in adults. Um, Multi-institutional studies have shown that it improves the stone passage rate and time. Um, so we do still use them typically for stones under one centimeter in size. Um, we want kids to be as comfortable as they can and pass it as quickly as they can. They actually do quite a better job at spontaneous stone passage, um, I believe, compared with what adults do. Um, most of the time when I see a kid with a ureteral stone and I put them on an alpha blocker, I only give them NSAIDs, the Mertrin. I do not give um, narcotic pain medications to go along with that. If they're needing narcotics and their pain is truly that bad as a child, they need a surgical intervention. Um, thiazide diuretics. So this is typically reserved for your hypercalciuric kids. So our nephrologists are the ones who do our workups in the States. They'll do dietary interventions first. They'll make sure that they're consuming enough fluid, that they've reduced sodium intake in their diet, they have appropriate calcium intake. And if they're failing and still having stones, they'll repeat a 24 hour urine. If they see um, hypercalciuria, they will start a thiazide diuretic. It can cause some mild hypokalemia. So often they're on potassium citrate at the same time. And then uh, citrate supplementation alkalinizes the urine, which can inhibit calcium oxide crystallization. Um, very helpful when it comes in, when you have an older kid, they can take the big, huge pills that basically show up like a wax cast in their poop. So you have to warn them you're going to poop out your pills. Um, but if they're really young, as most of our patients are with stones, we give them calcium or we give them potassium citrate in the form of bicitra. Um, doesn't taste great. It gives a lot of people GERD and acid reflux or belly upset. Some people say it gives you onion breath. Um, there, is, there are other products that are over the counter on the market. Um, one that I like is litholite that has no taste and can dissolve in water or juice. So we'll sometimes do that instead of the pills or the bicitra. And then cysteine binders for your cystinurics. So tiopronin or thiola is going to reduce your risk of stone formation by about 63 to 71%. But I always tell my cystinurics, you're going to have more stones. It's a matter of when. Part of the real challenge is these kiddos form stones so early that with multiple ureteroscopies and multiple impacted stones mo moving through their ureters, they often will form ureteral strictures. Um, and so I'm a bit more aggressive about doing percutaneous nephrolithotomy in these kiddos now that we have many perks. There's um, pyridoxine and then uh, lumazarin for your primary hyperoxaluric's. So I wanted to go over a stone protocol that we created because kids don't present like adults do. So we've, we've discussed how their symptoms can be quite different. Um, one of the things that we did with our ER when I was in Pittsburgh is we created this um, triage guideline because most of the time what would happen is they'd get an ultrasound and the ER would stop there. They wouldn't even necessarily call urology as long as the patient wasn't infected. The patient would show up to our clinic. They would have no hydronephrosis and multiple calocele tip stones. And then the family thinks that's the source of the pain. We all know it's not, <laughs> but um, we wanted to make sure that we actually gave them a diagno correct diagnosis of the stone, knew where it was and how big it was at the time that they were diagnosed with a symptomatic stone. 
So um, flank pain or gross hematuria, older kids are often gonna have flank pain, younger kids are often gonna have gross hematuria. Those are two easy things you can flag at the time of ER triage. Um, there was also a sepsis screen that was done for kids who um, popped positive for flank pain or gross hematuria. The nurse collected urines right away and ordered the renal bladder ultrasound to get him started. And then the doc would come in and see him after the ultrasound um, if the ultrasound was positive, you could clearly see a stone with proximal hydronephrosis. So the classic example would be a stone wedged at the UVJ where you see hydroureter, or a stone wedged at the UPJ where you see hydronephrosis. So if you saw that, you could stop there. If you saw hydronephrosis, but no stone was visualized, or if you saw um, a non-obstructing stone, so there was a stone floating in the kidney, but there was no hydro, then they had to proceed to the next step. Now, if they had a negative ultrasound, there was nothing that went along with stones, the ER could dictate their workup going forward. Anybody we suspected had stones got a BMP and a urinalysis, the urinalysis to see if it was an infected stone, and then they got a sepsis screen. And then the next step, so again, these are our three categories in yellow up top, um, if they were positive and it was their first stone, we want to know was that their total stone burden. So we know that many kids have multiple stones um, or they have underlying abnormal anatomy. So they did get a CT scan, only if it was the first. If they were septic, urology would be called immediately. They would still get a CT. If it was equivocal, so you had hydronephrosis but no visualized stone, they would get a CT for that. And then if the CT was negative, it wasn't a stone, the workup would proceed with some other route. Usually this was a UPJ obstruction um, or maybe vesicle urethral reflux with the urinary tract infection that was dilating in nature. Um, and then they would see urology as an outpatient. If they were doing well in about two weeks, they'd be given a strainer. Um, if they were not doing well, they were septic or they were infected, they were admitted for their stent. So diagnostic imaging in the first line should really always be renal ultrasound in children. Um, the problem with kidney ultrasound is that it's really less sensitive and specific than CT. And so unless you're using a protocol where it kind of guides the next steps, a good way to think about um, working up stones is if you do an ultrasound, get a KUV, right? Because the KUV will at least show you calcification if you have hydronephrosis. Um, the problem is the KUVs don't always show you calcification. So if you have cysteine stones, if you have uric acid-based stones, you're actually not going to see those very well on a KUV. Um, a CT is always a pretty helpful thing to have. You can design non-contrast CT scans with much less radiation than even the adult ones because you don't really care if the image is grainy, you just care about the stone and where it is. That's very easy to see because it's so radio dense. Um, so you can accept a little bit of artifact. Um, and so the dose can be as low as the equivalent of two spine x-rays, um, somewhere between about two and five x-rays. So what I will say about that is if you have a workup protocol, it's perfectly reasonable to start with ultrasound. If you don't have a workup protocol, then, and you have very high suspicion of uh, stone, then CT is your gold standard imaging. Um, so surgical indications, if they have uncontrollable renal colic, again, these are usually gonna be your older patients. Intractable nausea or vomiting, which are sometimes your kids with Adidas crisis or an underlying UPJ obstruction. Um, if they have infected or obstructed, like impacted stones in the upper urinary tract. Um, if they have impaired renal function. So many of our kids have only a solitary kidney or underlying renal disease. Um, and then if they have persistent obstructive hydronephrosis generally after about six weeks. So say you diagnosed a stone in the ER, sent the kiddo home, gave them a trial of passage. After six weeks, they still haven't passed their stone. That's when renal changes can start to occur and I would book them for surgery. 
so how do we know what surgery to do? Um, so kidney stones that are less than two centimeters in size will generally select for your ureteroscopy or ESWL in children. Honestly, these guidelines don't change very much from kids versus adults. Uh, what, what I will say is that certain areas of the world have more access to ESWL than others. So in the US, it's not a very popular intervention. And if so, it's very regional. Um, in Pittsburgh, I didn't have access to an ESWL at all. Here I do, but it's pretty hard to come by. Um, it can, when I was at Mayo Clinic, we had one in the OR and it was owned by the OR, so pretty easy to come by. In Europe, it's their first line. So it really kind of depends on where you are. So there's no one uh, surgical technique I'll tell you you have to use for those smaller stones, but there are good ways to select the patients. Um, a kidney stone that's greater than two centimeters, ureteroscopy, yes, it is an option, but I would say PCNL is probably a better option. So when you have that much stone burden, it's gonna be impossible to clear them with just one setting. You're gonna need to bring them back multiple times. If you're gonna do multiple surgeries, um, at that point, it's not, the anesthesia risk is still substantial and the cost is higher to the patient. I would go with the more effective approach, which is PCNL. Now that we have mini PCNL for children, so it's not a 30 French sheath anymore, we can go down as low as 13. Um, it's a more realistic thing to do to clear our larger stones. Lower pole stones can be very difficult to access ureteroscopically. Um, the situation I'm thinking of in particular is when there's an underlying UPJ obstruction. If you have an underlying UPJ, especially if there's scar there, you are not going to be able to deflect your scope enough to get into that lower pole to have um, adequate visualization of the whole lower pole calyx and the calyceal system. So that's probably a better PCNL, even if it's a one centimeter stone, it's pretty much a chip shot. Um, you can leave them tubeless. ESWL can be considered for lower pole stones when there's very little angle between the lower pole calyx and the UPJ or the ureter. So if you have a, um, a pretty acute angle, um, it, it's not the best approach because you're asking those stone fragments to drain up and then down. But if you have a 90 degree or so angle, so there's a fair bit of renal atrophy and your lower pole calyx is almost on par with your UPJ, it's maybe more of a reasonable consideration. Uh, proximal ureteral stones are amenable to ESWL or ureteroscopy, distal stones, ureteroscopy, those are kind of easy, no brainers. Um, in terms of ESWL, the stone free rates are highly variable. And a lot of this is because ESWL was used for everything. And then they kind of got better about realizing which stones it worked for. So namely the mid and the upper pole stones, the proximal ureteral stones, stones less than two centimeters, stones you could see. Um, the success rate in the ureter is higher because that stone's not moving. Um, so the ideal stone is a UPJ or a proximal ureteral stone. We sometimes do stent kids if we shock larger stones to prevent a Steinstrasse, which is basically a stack of stones in the lower ureter. It does not enhance stone clearance to stent them. It only prevents postoperative ureteral obstruction from stone fragments. Um, ESWL, probably not the best option for really, really hard, dense calcium oxalate myohydrate stones. So these are going to be like your near 1,000 Hounsfield unit stones, um, especially lower pole of kidney, distal ureter. Um, it is safe and effective for children. That's been shown. I have personally seen a slightly higher uh, perinephric hematoma rate in the younger kiddos, but not so much the teens and the postpubertal kids. Um, complications, as we mentioned, perinephric hematoma, pulmonary contusion, just because the lungs um, are a bit more in your field, a bit closer to your stone. There's not as much retroperitoneal fat to separate these structures. Urinary tract infection is true for anyone with a stone. Um, Long-term risks may be slightly increased risk of hypertension 
but there's no definite causality. So if you have multiple recurrent stones and underlying chronic kidney disease, that increases the risk of hypertension too. So do recurrent UTIs and urine scarring. Um, the pig studies looking at ESWL as well as PCNL generally show good recovery in the short term of the kidney parenchyma, that it returns to baseline after stone treatment. Uh, ureteroscopic stone extraction with laser lithotripsy is ideal for a patient that has stone burden less than two centimeters and non-cysteine stones. So why do I say non-cysteine? It's a very, very hard stone. So it's less amenable to our conventional lasers. Um, it doesn't dust. It only fragments and leaves shale. So your, your ideal uh, stones are going to be uric acid or calcium based or even uh, some of the rare medication based stones. Lower pole stones, as long as you can get to them with a ureteroscope, are very amenable. Certainly better to do ureteroscopy versus ESWL for lower pole. Um, but it's ideal for ureteral stones as well. Um, about a third of children are going to need pre-stenting. So we don't have any different size access sheets or um, dual lumens than you do in the adult world. We use the same ones, um, just shorter. Uh, my favorite, my preferred access sheet is, a, is an 1113 access sheet because then I can still get my ureteroscope up and have some degree of flow around it. Once you go to the 810s, you have no flow. It is nearly impossible. And the only ureteroscope that realistically flips up that is your Flex X uh, ureteroscope with difficulty. Um, ureteroscopy can be performed and usually is by fluoroscopy, but more recently people are doing ureteroscopy under ultrasound guidance for pregnant women. And that may be something that we can look to uh, develop in the future for children to minimize radiation. Um, Stone-free rates are pretty good on ureteroscopy with appropriately selected patients. Best for smaller stones, stones in the ureter, or non-cysteine stones. Um, ureteral injury is kind of your, your biggest risk factor in terms of complications. And then not a true complication, but something that a lot of kids experience or the irritative voiding, voiding symptoms. Um, adults notoriously hate their stents. Kids do a lot better than adults do, um, but teens do worse. <laughs> so it can be very challenging for your teenage patients with stents. Um, unplanned visits, so ER visits after ureteroscopy is really pretty high. And I think a lot of it is due to stent intolerance and flank pain. Maybe some of it is due to high intrarenal pressures. There's new technology being developed that allows us to pressure regulate our intrarenal pressures with our irrigation flow so that we keep it at 40 centimeters of water or less. They've shown that when you um, use pathfinders and the, the um, little bulbs to blast saline to hydro distend your renal pelvis and find your stone, you actually can increase the intrarenal pressures to 100 centimeters of water or more. And uh, patients tend to have more postoperative pain. You will create um, potentially pilovenous or pilointerstitial backflow in doing that as well. So when do we pre-stent? So here's a great example. You have a patient with an underlying UPJ. This patient has a long, narrow segment um, stone in the lower pole, it's hard to see right here. Uh, I think that was one as well. So if you have an underlying UPJ obstruction, best to stent them. You know you're not getting your, um, your reader scope easily through there. You know you're not bringing any fragments through that UPJ. Um, you also know that even if you dust it, it's not gonna clear well with a stenotic or narrow area. It needs to be pre-dilated. Um, this is a good example of where there's a lot of ureteral edema. So this stone was stuck right here and then dislodged into the renal pelvis, but it was hard to get past it. And there was a lot of ureteral edema and narrowing here. So this is not one that I would go up and try to primary ureteroscope. 
um, that was a tough uh, retrograde pilogram to do and stent to get in. So when you're seeing very little contrast flow, go past your stone, suspect you have an, in, an impacted stone, um, get a stent passed. And if you can't get a stent passed, get a PCN placed. But best not to primarily treat them. Um, percutaneous nephrolithotomy. So these are going to be almost exclusively cases for greater than two centimeters of stone burden or hard to get to stones or cysteine stones. Your stag horn calculi, fortunately, are much less common in children. We used to see them a lot more with our poorly managed neurogenic bladder patients. They had a lot of bacteria. They had vesicoureteral reflux. They had stagnant urine, slow drainage. They got staghorn calculi. So your, um, your classic magnesium ammonium phosphate type of stag, an infection uh, stag. But fortunately with better bladder management, we're really just seeing fewer and fewer of those now. Um, so that, that is fantastic. The other thing that I will say is percutaneous nephrolithotomy doesn't just have to happen through the kidney. Many kids with reconstructive bladders will have big bladder stones. And you can actually use the same type of approach to perk directly into their bladder and treat their stone in the same way. Um, kiddos who have additional indications for PCNL, if you can't get up into their bladder because they have a closed bladder net, if they have significant malrotation or horseshoe kidney where you know that your UPJ is gonna go up and then down in a nearly um, U-shaped fashion. So these are classically like your horseshoes. It's nearly impossible to get into the lower pole with your ureteroscopy. And sometimes PCN is just better. Um, CT is definitely recommended before performing PCNL because you wanna make sure number one, you get all the stone. Um, you may see a stone on ultrasound, but that may not be the only one. And you also really, really need to know if they have any malrotation. This is much more common in children that they have underlying anatomic abnormalities because uh, that's gonna influence where your, your perk tube is put in. Um, Um, in terms of stone clearance, so there are several algorithms that are specific to adults that people have looked at to see whether or not they apply to children. Um, the stone uh, algorithm for knowing if you can clear stones with PCNL is probably not quite as good. Um, that's also because honestly, in practice, not all kids get a CT. Sometimes people actually do go straight to PCNL without that CT, and the stone relies on having a pre-op CT. Crows and guys, uh, or GSS, are going to be your two most effective algorithms, and I actually really like to use those because it gives parents the expectation that, hey, I might not have 100% success with your kid's difficult stone and their difficult anatomy, it may take two surgeries, but this is my average stone-free rate. Um, we all classically think of PCNL as 98 or more percent effective, but the reality is that when you're dealing with kids with altered anatomy and sometimes cysteine stones, that may not be the case. There are reasons that these can fail too. Um, the complication rate is definitely higher. So historically, it was about 20%, and that was with your 30 French access tract. The biggest complication was bleeding. Um, there was a 10 to 20% risk of transfusion and significant bleeding or perinephric hematoma. I will say that after uh, many PCNL and the miniaturized techniques, that rate is down to 8% or less. Um, so I, uh, I definitely think that PCNL now in most pediatrologists' hands has a lower complication rate. But these are often more infected stones. They are often more um, wedged at the UPJ or have underlying abnormal anatomy. And so reasons that the fragments might, might not clear. The moral of the story is do PEDS PCNL if you do a lot of them. So this is best as a regionalized treatment. 
Um, complications are linked to operative time, staghorn, multiple access tracks, multiple punctures, very similar to the adult world. So mini and micro PCNL, I'm really excited about because we don't need to use big, huge adult equipment in our tiny little kids. Um, renal access does have a high fluoro use though. So even though we can get into the kidney with much smaller access tracks, uh, sometimes we just have to find better ways of doing it. And this is one of the problems. When I look at the fluoro use for a lot of my IR docs that are getting me access in the calyx that I want, or when I look at the total fluoro time for some of these cases, it can be several minutes, two to three minutes. And that's a lot. Um, that's far more than we would use for ureteroscopy. Ureteroscopy, we might use 20, 30 seconds of fluoro. Whereas with PCNL, I've seen even five minutes you have to reset your fluoro monitor. Um, and these are kids who are gonna have multiple stones over their lifetime. So best to try to limit their fluoro use. One of the ways we can try to do that may be with ultrasound guided access. Um, and many of the adults are now using direct visualization access. So they'll go up the ureter on a split leg table, which we can do for older kids with the ureteroscope, look into the calyx that they want, and then perk directly onto it with the use of minimal fluoro. Um, mini PCNL is a technique where you can use a 20 French or less access sheet. Micro PCNL or ultra mini PCNL is going to be your 13 French or less. There are even needlescopic PCNLs, which are like nine French. I think um, they're done in India, uh, Dr. Desai, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know of anybody doing the needlescopic um, or the needle PCNLs here in the US, um, but I don't, I don't know everybody doing them. <laughs> now, these types of PCNL techniques are gonna need um, a miniaturized ultrasonic probe most of the time for harder stones, I also like to have pneumatic probes. There are only a few of these being made or in production. Most people actually use their laser. So if their hospital owns the laser, then they'll laser fragment things. That can take a long time to do with two centimeters of stone burden or a stag. So if you have very large stone burden, you probably want your ultrasonic and your pneumatic probe. You do give up continuous renal irrigation. So on your 30 French sheath with your 26 French nephroscope, you've got the in irrigation and the out irrigation. You don't have that for mini or micro PCNL. You have an in and you have to periodically take out your nephroscope and drain it, or it'll just leak around the nephroscope by design for some of the different brands. So you get a little less renal distension but you also don't tend to have as much um, high intrarenal pressures. Bottom line visualization can be a little bit challenging if you're not used to it. Um, Post-operative drainage is optional. So using a stent or a nephrostomy tube, if they have any underlying ureteral edema, UPJ obstruction, you really have to leave a drainage tube. So a ureteral stent would be the most typical. You can advance the anagrade. Um, I'll move on. Um, what are the laser types? I think I'm doing okay on time. So laser types are gonna be holmium and thulium. Um, these are the kind of two mainstays that we use now in the US. Pneumatic probes are pretty much dead, um, especially because they're just dangerous. Um, so there's a higher rate of ureteral injury with the pneumatic probes. Um, so we've switched to holmium and thulium. Now, holmium is really very, very safe, but it's not particularly efficient. Thulium is very, very efficient, but historically hadn't been particularly safe. What they've done with thulium fiber lasers is redesign them to be a fixed wattage of either eight or 10 watts for their laser so that you don't get as much heating of the local tissues and uh, urine. So if you have a high wattage thulium laser, you can heat that collecting system and cause thermal injury of the kidney or the ureter. So this is a classic um, um, 
pictorial representation down here. You just can't achieve very much energy with the Holmian YAG lasers. Um, the, the typical settings we use can look similar though. So I wanted to go over some of those. Um, Holmium laser settings, you're typically going to have a fragmentation setting. This is the one on the left. It says left petal. And then you're going to have a uh, dusting setting. This is the one that says right petal. Notice that the wattage or the power, uh, the energy is about the same on both. Um, I shouldn't say energy, I should say power. So the power is about the same on both. Uh, the energy in joules and the frequency in hertz are different. So my classic fragmentation settings for a kid are going to be between 0.8 and 8 up to 1.2 and 12. And for fragmentation, they're going to be in the 0.3 and 50 range, sometimes 0.2 and even higher frequencies. If your laser will go that high, many of them won't. Um, the Classic Holmium lasers were sometimes as low as 15 watts. Um, they really could only fragment. And that's because the best you're ever going to get on your settings is like 0.5 and 10. Um, that's not really a dusting setting. So that's more of a fragmentation setting. So your old school Holmium lasers that are 15 watts, you can pretty much fragment with. Um, the newer school Holmium lasers, so your 60, 100, 120 watt lasers, these are the ones you can dust with. Um, and then one other just talking point that I like to point out whenever I'm doing kidney surgery, especially if it's endoscopic, I like to put a radiopaque marker because I have seen um, and had to review cases where people did wrong site surgery. Um, just because obviously the patient's right is your left. And so if he, everybody in the room is not double checking you, um, these kinds of things can happen. Uh, thulium, thulium laser settings are gonna be a little bit different, but again, often still preset. So if you look at this example on an Olympus thulium laser, they have lithotripsy settings, soft tissue ablation settings, and BPH settings. So that's like for your laser nucleations. Um, your softer stones are typically gonna be more of a dusting type of setting. Your harder stones are more of that fragmentation setting, um, but still they have similar power, eight watts. So it's a little bit less power than what you um, see with the Holmium because it's a more efficient laser. Um, biggest downside to thulium, it's expensive, but to me, it's hard to get. So a lot of people still use holmium. Um, the stone dilemma about fragmenting and dusting is always a fun one. It's a good way to get your endourologists worked up. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but dusting versus fragmenting and basketing was actually studied. It has only been studied in the adult world, not in children, uh, via the EDGE Research Consortium. Um, and basically, you know, the, the moral of the story is whatever you do, clear the stone. So if you're going to basket, you're probably more likely to clear all fragments. If you're dusting, um, you have to make sure that you don't see anything left. So it's not like a hard stone that broke into a little bit of shale. It's actually completely dusted. So many of these studies have found that when you fragment, you have a higher stone free rate as long as you get all of the fragments out. Um, the other kind of point about ureteroscopy in kids that's a little bit different than how we treat adults is that we're very intentional about our fluoro settings. So we wanna minimize radiation as much as possible. We were surprised when some of these studies came out from UPMC and from Boston about how much radiation was actually used in these cases. I mean, people had pretty heavy or lead feet on that fluoro pedal. Many times if you're letting your fluoro tech run the fluoro, they run it on cine or continuous fluoro, which is the, the most possible fluoro. And many people were not doing low dose settings. Um, in big, heavy adults with a lot of skin to stone distance, you might need pure fluoro. 
in children, you absolutely don't need pure fluoro. You can really get down to as low as eight to even um, 15 if you need to frames per second with pulsed fluoro, or you can just set it to low dose on your C arm and be easy. I think low dose is 15 frames per second. So um, when do we dust? Let's have that little fun video discussion. All right, and then when's a fragment? All right, and then a better fragmentation video. All right. So before we get into any difficult cases, I just want to ask if there are any questions or any talking points from the audience. Okay, I have a raised hand. Let's see if it's in the chat. Um, I can't see the question. Dr. Kigongo, can you take yourself off mute? Yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Fox, for the the children taking the ketogenic diet, what, what type of stones do they usually get? They're typically calcium-based stones. Um, it's rare that you would get pure uric acid stones, but you certainly can have uric acid heteronucleation. Um, most of the time though, we, we do see calcium oxalate stones. Okay. What about your ureteroscopy in, in PIDs? What, what's the smallest size you have access to? So most of them now, especially if you're using digital, are eight to nine five. So they escalate from eight at the tip to 9.5 at the proximal hub, um, which is why you need an 1113 access sheet. You can't get that size scope through an 810. Um, our, our sheath of 13 French really, um, with the friction with the scope, is still pretty tight with a 9.5 French scope. Um, we do have fiber optics still. The smallest fiber optic, I believe, is a 7.5, the FlexX. Okay. Uh, I think they are the same. We, we, we have it. I think the technology wouldn't allow the French size to go smaller to six or something. No, um, if you have a kiddo where you can't get the access sheath up, you should just stent and come back at least two weeks later. So I never really try to push or force an access sheath. 
Again, if I can't get an 1113 up, I'm probably going to need a pre stent. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Now, you, if you have distal ureteral stones, so if you have something in the lower ureter that you can go after, you may not need to pre stent because those there are smaller semi rigid scopes. Um, I think they're, we have a 4.5 French needle scopic but the visualization is terrible. I hate it. Um, and then there's the six uh, to seven French um, semi-rigid. So you can actually get that up pretty easily. So I'll put in my safety wire and then I'll take a second wire um, and just use that as my, my introducer to gently dilate the UO. I never balloon dilate a UO in a kid. So if I can't get the tip of my ureteroscope through for distal rigid ureteroscopy, I stent, I come back another day. Um, the risk of tearing or damaging a kid's ureter and causing stricture, they have to live with that their entire life. Um, and if you have a kid with stones, you know that they're forming more. So you know you're gonna have to go up that ureter again. Other questions? Okay. Um, I'll present, I think, four difficult cases, or you can cut me off when we are at time. Um, this first one, they're kind of going from easier to harder. <laughs> this first one is a kiddo with stones with an underlying UPJ obstruction. So he has hydronephrosis, but also, oops, sorry lower pole stones. You see this conglomeration of shadowing lower pole stones, pretty classic uh, distal echogenic shadow with the hydronephrosis that is not due to the stone, it's due to the UPJ. So this was a 13 year old who presented with cyclical vomiting, had multiple right lower pole stones seen on renal ultrasound confirmed on KUB, but was not interested in an open pyeloplasty. Um, so he was actually sent to another hospital for a robotic pyeloplasty. Um, the robotic pyeloplasty is a nice technique because you can just basically snake a camera in one of the robotic ports, um, go through your pelviotomy. So when you open your renal pelvis for the pyeloplasty, you take a flexible cystoscope, go through that renal pelvis opening down into the lower pole and then basket those stones. Now, when you look at these stones, it's not like this big, beautiful, um, dense stone, it looks a little fluffy. It's not very well seen on the KUB. And the reason for that is because it was actually like a snow globe um, or a whole bunch of little tiny ones. So you have to be prepared to suction these guys out. Um, this would be actually very difficult to do in an open fashion. Um, you could take a flexible cystoscope and do the same thing through your open incision. But when you're robotic, you put your um, endocatch bag underneath your um, renal pelvic opening, and then you can irrigate in and suction out, irrigate, suck, irrigate, suck with your sucker and get the really tiny ones out that you can't basket. Um, so that one was that one was a little bit more of a challenging case and one of the unexpected findings with renal stones underlying a UPJ obstruction. Had you gotten a CT, you might have seen it, but sometimes those little tiny stones, they layer, and so it actually looks like just a long stone. Um, the second difficult case to present was an impacted, infected ureteral stone. So classic case, this little girl has Rett syndrome. She is neurologically devastated. She has a G-tube, she's G-tube fed. She has seizures, she's on a ketogenic diet. Um, she, her G-tube feeds and free water flushes are managed by her dietitian, but they kind of failed to increase the volumes over time with her bodily growth. So she's actually in a chronically dehydrated state. She was only getting like five to 600 mLs per day and she's nine years old. So she was a setup for a stone. She'd also had spinal 
fixation surgery, further immobilizing her and preventing her from doing PT. So that big eight millimeter Goomba that's sitting in the right kidney um, had been seen on multiple spine films, but ortho really never engaged urology um, because she wasn't symptomatic. The hard part is knowing when a kiddo who can't communicate with you is symptomatic. So many of these kiddos, they present with febrile urinary tract infections or urosepsis. The data would show between 20 and 30% are gonna present with a febrile UTI. And that is absolutely not true for renal stones in um, other kiddos. So our neurologically devastated kiddos or our um, nonverbal kiddos um, they're more commonly presenting with UTI. So uh, she had her spine surgery. She had this image. They knew about the stone. One month later, she presented with recurrent fevers. Um, so her ultrasound obviously showed hydronephrosis. She went to the OR for a ureteral stent to relieve her um, infected stone. But it had been there for a while. And so when you, when you looked back through all of these x-rays, it had actually been there for several months. Um, so not surprising that it got infected, not surprising that it was impacted. So when we initially tried to do the retrograde pilogram, the wire went right through the ureter. It wasn't even any resistance. It just went right through the ureter. So she had initial extravasation of contrast. And we were able to get a stent past it. Um, so what are some of the tricks for when you've perforated a ureter or you have an impacted stone to still get your renal access? Um, first, obviously, probably all of us know we can try a glide wire. Um, if that's not working because it's so flimsy and it's not going to have any purchase against that stone, you can give it a little jet of contrast or a jet of saline. I've even tried mineral oil. Um, some people try a little bit of lube through their five French ureteral catheter just below that stone to try to um, hydraulically move it or dislodge it, and then you can get the wire passed. Um, and that's exactly what we did. So we forcibly we water jetted or saline jetted the stone up a little bit to get the, um, um, the second wire up, stented her, and then we came back at least six weeks later for ureteroscopic extraction to allow that whole site to heal and the stone to um, mature in a non-impacted state. So you want to give that ureter a, a good chance to dilate around that stone so that you're going to be able to get it out and it's not wedged under a whole layer of urethelium. Uh, the third case, so this was kind of a tough one. Uh, this is a kiddo who's referred to me, he's 12, and he had multiple cystic lesions in his left ectopic kidney. So this is the um, upper pole of the left kidney, sitting right over the psoas. Here is a stone increasing in size. Maybe it's two stones right next to one another, but it sits right over the transverse process right over the psoas. The renal hilum is just below this. So really tricky position to get to. You're not gonna be able to do a robotic calocele diverticulectomy and resect it. You're not gonna be able to perk that. This is not a small child. His skin to stone distance is like 15 centimeters. So what do you do? He's already been your reader scope once. They couldn't find his stone. So this is exactly where a CT urogram is very helpful. So I did a CT urogram and this showed me where that calocele diverticulum was. Um, number one, that the contrast actually did communicate with the collecting system. So there was a reasonable expectation I could find a neck. And then um, I did this case ureteroscopically with a thulium laser. So one of the ways um, that you can open up the neck of a calocele diverticulum is with a holmium laser. Holmium lasers have a little bit uh, deeper depth of penetration when you're, um, when you're incising soft tissue. So you will get more bleeding. With the thulium laser, it's a whole lot more superficial. So you actually get a little bit less bleeding. Um, 
I also did not want this stone to fragment. I really wanted to be able to dust it to clear it out because I knew that my working space, once I got up into that calyceal diverticulum, was not going to be very much, and I wasn't going to be able to move my stone past a narrowed neck. So it's going to be hard to get in and out of that to repeatedly basket fragments. Um, so that's why I chose to dust it with a thulium laser, even though I don't routinely use a thulium laser. Um, then you ablate as much of the diverticulum as you can. So you basically go and um, kiss the walls of the diverticulum with your laser. Honestly, your reteroscopic calyceal diverticuli ablations, they don't do a great job of really shrinking the tick. They do a good job of opening the neck. And then it can be very hard to get a stent across that neck you've opened. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, but I always try. All right, last case. This is one of my problem patients. All right, so this little guy is a cystinuric. He's five, he's autistic, and he does not like anyone in medicine, and he doesn't like anyone in medicine touching him. Um, so it's particularly challenging for both social and disease process um, reasons. He had bilateral partial staghorns from his um, cystinuria. So I will show you, he's been stented already. So this is not a CT urogram, that's all stone. Both sides, high volume. Unfortunately, it's not like a stag where you could go in and do a pelviolithotomy and pull it all out. It's multiple stones. Um, you also notice that on the right, I'll play that again. On the right, he doesn't have nearly as much hydronephrosis as he does on the left. And that left one extends all the way down to the UPJ. So that raised some eyebrows. All right, so he underwent a bilateral uh, percutaneous nephrolithotomy. Everybody would do that. It's very high stone burden. Um, they were staged PCNLs, so the right side first, left side later, because we know it would take a while to clear out one side. Um, the right side cleared very well. The left side had several residual six to 12 millimeter stones. It was very difficult to get PCN access. Um, took multiple tries, even just to get into the upper pole, even though it was a dilated system. Um, and then ultimately there were some stones left behind on this side, on the left side. Um, and this is actually the time at which I'm meeting the patient. So he has a lower pole, or I guess a mid pole stone, and then another separate stone next to it. And that's his nephrostomy. All right. Um, so, the decision was made to basically give this guy a little break from us. We knew he had a residual 1.2 centimeter left renal stone. We were going to come back another day and get it because we'd been through a lot and he wasn't tolerating being in the hospital. So he had a stent placed. Um, his stent was removed. He failed, had renal colic, actually presented with a febrile UTI, stent got replaced. That was the point at which we diagnosed an underlying UPJ obstruction on the left. So he actually got perked first, and then this was confirmed, no contrast went down the ureter, and then the anagrade stent was placed. Well, now comes the tricky part. So he st started on thiola. He's been on thiola for about four weeks into his stenting. And they're compliant with it, but they can't get him to drink well. Um, you see this little guy's residual 1.2 centimeter stone right here. It's nowhere near where it's causing his obstruction. He's got some debris down here too. Um, so I went to pull out his stent to convert him to a PCN, at, PCN before his pyeloplasty, and I couldn't get it out. <laughs> so uh, one of the moral of the story, morals of the story in these cystinuric kiddos is they encrust. He was on thiola 
but he's still encrusted. Um, and that's just because it's so critical to have them totally hydrated on thiola and on potassium citrate, and still they may form stones and still they may encrust stones. Um, but his is probably due to, to poor PO intake, at least in part. So um, I was ultimately able to get out the stent in an anagrade fashion. I perked him, got this stone out, got the stent out and converted into a PCM. Um, and then I think the last teaching point for this case is just that you have to re-expand the renal pelvis that looks like this. So one of the challenges you'll get with these chronically wedged impacted kind of partial stags is that they don't always have a big blown out UPJ like UPJ obstructions. So this kid's renal pelvis has been decompressed for some time with either stenting or PCNL. So it's not really even big enough to do a pyeloplasty on. It, it needs to dilate, it needs to expand. Um, because this is an inflammatory or a stone-based stricture. So it's not like you have a crossing vessel where there's good healthy ureter underneath. You're going to have at least a centimeter, maybe two, of just bad, thick and awful tissue that you have to mobilize and bring together. All right. Any questions? There's one question in the chat, Dr. Fox. Um, Oh, perfect. From uh, Dr. Colleen. Thank you for the wonderful presentation for PCNL and children. Do you always have to insert a ureteric catheter prior? Great question. Um, I actually don't insert a ureteral catheter first. I insert a PCN. So if I know that I'm going to do a PCNL in a kid, I'm going to put in a percutaneous nephrostomy tube. If I don't know that, so say they came in uroseptic and I just had to get them drained, it would be very reasonable to put in a ureteral stent and then remove it at a later date. Um, you really don't want a dilated ureter when you go in to do your PCNL because all of those fragments then travel straight down your ureter. When you do a PCNL and you have a renal pelvic stone, the natural tendency is that stone drifts down towards the UPJ and that's where you're doing very much of your lithotripsy and then all of those fragments are going to drift down the ureter, especially if you're using laser. So if you're using an ultrasonic lithotripture with a suction capacity, maybe that happens a little bit less. So like the Trilogy lithotripture, the Uratron, uh, the shock pulse, the, these all have ultrasonic and suction, just like the adult ones do that we're used to using. But um, I, I really don't want that ureter to be pre-dilated. So I make every effort to not pre-stent these kids. Other questions? Dr. Kutessa? All right, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, just to ask you just a general question. Um, um, if you want to fragment the stone, which one is better, acrosonic and, and pneumatic? Which one will be I think it's better fragmentation? Um, I didn't quite get the question. It was breaking up a little bit, but it was about fragmentation. Yes, if you're using ultrasonic and pneumatic histotriptas, oh. which one is better in fragmenting? What can you do recommend? For ureteroscopy or for PCNL? For both, either way. I don't use pneumatic in the ureter ever. Um, the risk of ureter injury is very, very high. So I, I really only use a laser inside the ureter. Um, ultrasonic and pneumatic can both be used in the kidney because there's a whole lot more space and there's less pressure transmission, plus that pressure is offset through your bigger nephroscope sheath. Um, so I, I would only use holmium or thulium in the ureter 
And then you can use pretty much anything you want to in the kidney. Or in the bladder. If you have a bladder stone, we could use ultrasonic, we could use pneumatic. Um, hard stones, I use a combination of both. So I typically will use the Trilogy um, Lithotriptor by Boston Scientific. And for the harder stones, I almost always do a combination of ultrasonic and pneumatic with at least 50% uh, suction. Um, for the softer ones, you can get away with ultrasonic. So like some of your lower Hounsfeld units, 800 Hounsfeld units or less, that's very reasonable. If you have a cysteine stone, you have to do both ultrasonic and pneumatic. Other questions? If there's nothing else, Dr. Fox, I just wanted to personally thank you for your time. This is a wonderful lecture. And uh, Dr. Kingongo, Kitesa, uh, Dabanja, thank you for helping coordinate. Thank you. Thank you for the coordination and identifying the, identifying the, the teachers for us. Thank you very much for having me. It was a wonderful opportunity and I was glad to meet all of you. Thanks everyone. Have a good evening. Yeah. You as well.